This is an I Am Listening original podcast. The problem that may arise for Keir Starmer and, and the Labour Party generally is, is that people are impatient for that change. He's talked about change. How can he deliver it? How do you stop the small boats? How do you stop prison overcrowding? How do you fix the NHS? How, there's so many things that need to be done. I mean, we all work in local government or covering local government and local government's in a mess. How does he fix that? There are so many things that he needs to address. Welcome to the Kent Politics Podcast, your go-to source for insightful discussions on local and national political matters. Join us as we take a deep dive into local government across the county. Find out what the key decision makers have to say, what your money is being spent on, and how the party's policies could affect how we live. Plus, don't miss our regular feature, Westminster Watch, where we dissect the latest developments and decisions shaping the political landscape in the heart of the UK's capital. Engage with us as we delve into the issues that matter to you and explore the dynamic world of politics from a Kent perspective. Welcome to the Kent Politics Podcast, which we're recording straight after coming out of the election counts across the county. I'm Simon Finney, local democracy reporter covering Kent County Council, and I was at the Weald of Kent Count, and I'm joined by Robert Boddy, who was at the three Midway Counts. Hello. Dan Essen, who was down in Dover. Hello. And we're also joined by Group Political Editor Paul Francis for his take on an historic election in Kent and across the UK. Hello. Paul, what does the new political map of Kent now look like? Well, it's gone from a heavily shade of blue to one which features the yellow of the Liberal Democrats, a small piece, some red spots and some blue spots, and it's uh, it's changed quite considerably. Like German measles. Yes, (laughs) something like that. It looks rather like a funky new wallpaper, you might Yeah, think. yeah, something you might get in Ikea. So they've gone really from 16, the Tories have gone from 16 seats to, I think, six, isn't it? Mm. So they did slightly better than the polls suggested, but really not great. No, it was a terrible night for the Conservatives, and uh, I think they're going to be very sore about this for a long time. And it casts a shadow over their immediate future because they've now lost so many MPs, so many people who are ministers. Mm. They've got to start rebuilding and it's going to take a long time. Yeah, the the pool of talent's going to be um, somewhat smaller, shallower than it has been previously. So where do you think they're going to start rebuilding from? Well, uh, that's the interesting question, isn't it? When I spoke to Roger Gale about what might happen uh, after an election in which they lost, he said he would be fighting for the soul of the party and he is amongst the MPs who believe that rebuilding starts from the centre ground not on the right on the far right Mm. that's what he's he'll be planning to do it's been tight um there are ebbs and flows sometimes you know you're going to win sometimes you wonder if you're going to win 1997 my majority went down to even lower than it is now we shall come back up again and we'll rebuild it. I, I've got a job of work to do. Um, and I think as inevitably one of the senior members of the House, our job is going to have to be to try to make this work in the interests of everybody across the country. A lot of new members of Parliament on both sides of the House. We've obviously lost a lot of good people. But there will be good people coming in on the other side. And I reckon that my job as, as a veteran, if you like, is to try to answer the questions and to help them to do the job in the interest of the people they represent. How do you wish to do that? Because I want to be asking that because you are, have always been a relatively moderate voice, a voice of reason in the House. And do you see yourself as a peer to both sides coming to this election? Obviously, we have Katie Lamb um, for, from the Wheel, which is in New Kent, but there's also plenty of other UMPs across Kent and beyond. What do you think your role is going to be in Parliament in the next five years? Well, I hope without being pompous, certainly to offer advice, because there is an enormous amount to learn when you first become a new member of Parliament. And I remember Dennis Skinner, when I first came into the House, um, said to me, I asked him a question, and he said, uh, well, if it was me, son, I'd do it this way, but because you're a Tory, you should do it this way. And actually, I was terribly sweet about it and told me how to do the job, that particular bit of the job. And there is this huge amount of camaraderie behind the scenes. Um, from my remarks on the platform tonight, you will understand that and there are some people that I would choose not to work particularly closely. But in the national interests, we have to get on and work together. So that's what we'll do. 
We'll come back to, you know, where we think that the leadership challenges may come from. Dan, who were the sort of outstanding winners and losers of the night? So, I mean, there's quite a few seats that, um, yeah, there, there were some that weren't entirely surprising. Where where I was in Dover, Mike Tapp won with a majority of about 7,500, the Labour candidate. Um, but what, what was, you know, at this point, after campaigning for two years, it'd be more surprising if he didn't take it. What was quite surprising was that the Reform Party, you know, just about beat the Conservatives and, and the Reform Party took second place, um, which obviously the, the Conservatives were not particularly pleased about. And similar in Folkestone, the um, Labour Party won in Folkestone, originally not one of their target seats. And, um, you know, Conservative Damien Collins, former MP, was deposed, um, but he was about five or six hundred votes away from being in third to the um to the reform to reform uk which um rumor has it he was he was not particularly happy yeah about. so i believe and uh, the seat of Tom as wells i mean it was tipped to go to the lib dems and it went to the lib dems by a pretty handsome margin about eight thousand six hundred yeah. something and like it's flipped quite a lot in the polls at various different points so we've said oh the lib dems will take it and then they said the conservatives will take it at one point i think some polls said Lab- maybe labor will take it but labor came in a pretty distant third behind liberal democrats mm. and conservatives but it's the first time tunbridge wells has been lib dem since 1906 and back then that was still the liberal party so so what did mike martin have to say for himself afterwards mike martin actually did, decided not to speak to any media whatsoever immediately after the um oh, really? after the result came out which is quite surprising given that his party have gone from having what 11 MPs to 60 or 70 and, and, and actually being parliament relevant in Parliament um, and d- despite that he, he didn't really want to say anything. Mm, we'll look forward to his words of wisdom in the future. Yeah, you'd think he'd want to talk you know, if, he, if he won so handsomely. Well, he was quite keen on talking when he was a candidate. Right, OK. Uh, w- were there any sort of surprises apart from Mike Martin's success? The two Helens, Helen Whitley and Helen Grant, were, you know, they were... Uh, Helen Grant was certainly tipped to lose, in, and uh, and Helen Whitley was um, was sort of at certain points during the campaigns was, was tipped to lose, but they both clung on with very slim majority. So that was a, not a surprise, but a surprise at the same time because those seats have sort of changed markedly. Helen Grant's obviously got the Maidstone and Mauling seat, which takes in a, of a completely different sort of constituent type than she perhaps had when she had the Weald in her patch. And uh, Faversham and Mid-Kent was one of the ones that um, nobody quite was quite sure how that one would go, but they both clung on by sort of 15, 1,600 votes. Um, down in the Wheel of Kent, the new seat, Kitty Lamb, came through with about 8,500 majority, which, again, was um, not unexpected, but one poll had, on the eve of the election, had Lenny Rolls, the Labour candidate, coming through on the inside with the possibility of him winning. But in the end, it was quite a, a quite a distant margin. For me, the big surprise was Damien Green in Ashford, who lost out. Again, that was one that was... That was predicted. It was, but I felt that he might be able to swing it round to his way because of his personal standing. Mm. And uh, I think what it did for him was the boundary changes, which uh, saw him lose a lot of the villages. Yeah, uh, the rural stuff, yeah. And uh, he took in his constituency now embraces Stanhope, the big housing estate, mm. and I think he paid the price for that. Yeah. Well, the the reform vote was very high and that's what really did for so many of the the candidates right across the country actually but uh, not least in Kent as well if you you know added the conservative vote and the reform vote because that's where the votes came from you would have seen you know far more conservative MPs in Kent than they actually ended up having so it's uh, an interesting sort of um whether it's all shaken down in the end. Robert, let's talk about uh, Medway. You were there last night. There were three seats up for grabs. Um, what what happened in the end? Uh, so all three seats which were held by the Conservatives for, for many years all flipped to Labour, um, which had been predicted, but a, a couple of them were a lot deemed to be a lot closer um, than others. In the end, uh, all three seats came to the Labour Party with about three or 4,000 majority. Um, but the key thing, I think, was that the Reform Party was about three or 4,000 behind the Conservatives. Uh, and I think it cannot be overstated the role they played mm. in handing these seats to the Labour Party. They totally took chunks out of the Conservative Party. And I think that's not just the case for in Medway. I think that we're seeing that in many seats mm. across both Kent and the country. Yeah, we just mentioned Ashford. I mean, if you combine the votes, it would be the same. And if um, reform went standing in, say, the Wheel of Kent, I mean, the, the, the majority would have been huge. So it, it can't be understated what effect 
that has had. But Reform have only got four MPs, and you have to ask yourself, well, they're not going to be able to pull that stunt again, are they? It was a bit like uh, UKIP in uh, 2013 when they very nearly took control of the county council, which which would have been a major uh, surprise, but they fell just short and, uh, after four years, disintegrated. Well, this this seems to happen, that perhaps if the the caucus of um, uh, reform MPs was bigger, that they would just give them more opportunity to to sort of squabble amongst themselves in the way that the UKIP was did. Yeah, UKIP was a party in which there were some serious factions, internal factions fighting, and uh, I think that's just the nature of the party. Do you think there's any any scope for um, Nigel Farage being able to tempt some of the harder right element of the the rump of the Conservative Party. Well, that's that's what's going to be interesting about which direction the, the Conservative Party goes in, because um, there, there, there will be two factions, one pushing for the party to resume its place at, at, the, at the centre, and those who want to take it in a, a right-wing direction. Is there a topic that you would like to be discussed on the Kent Politics Podcast? Perhaps you've got a question for one of our panel, or you'd like to comment on a hot topic in local or national government. Get in touch by emailing or sending a voice note to Kent Politics Podcast at the kmgroup.co.uk. You know, we've got some fairly high profile Conservative MPs still left in, in Kent. Um, any thoughts on possible contenders for the leadership should um, Sunak step down? Well, I mean, so Tom Tugendhat, MP for Tunbridge, has maintained he kept his seat by a very healthy margin. He previously run for the leadership of the Conservative Party, and one would assume that if you're an MP who harbours those kinds of ambitions, they don't simply disappear. Um, so he, he's been touted by some as a possible contender for the leadership. He sort of positions himself on the One Nation mm. wing of the party. So I'd, um, I mean, it w- wouldn't surprise me if um, if he gives it a go, wh- whether he has the clout among the you know his hundred and thirty something colleagues um, to actually succeed. Who knows? But I reckon he'll give it a go. Other Kent MP, remaining Kent Tory MPs, though. Um, I'm not entirely sure about like Laura, Laura Trott seems mm. one to watch she was Chief Secretary to the Treasury you know a position of quite some importance um, but I don't think she has much public profile to sort of run you know for, for a leadership position as of yet but Seven Oaks is a very safe Tory seat so I'm sure she if she can keep hold of the seat internally I'm, I'm sure she has plenty of time ahead of her to mull over that kind of thing mm. and she does have sort of youth on her side as well I guess and as, I suppose the, the other thing about the future of the, the Conservatives is, is you know do they stick to a right of centre sort of place or are they tempted to go sort of further to the right? Well, I, I think the, the party doesn't know itself mm. what it wants to do and that's a dangerous position to be in if it, it stays for a long time. Let's be honest about it, they were probably having discussions privately in the run-up to uh, the election day. Uh, so we know that there are factions within the party who, who do definitely want to... Uh, forge a stronger link with uh, Nigel Farage's lot and a, a group who feel that is totally the wrong direction to go in. That does create a problem. Um, if you do have those people who are sort of to the right of the party, it would probably make more sense to join the reform lot. Yeah, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an unusual situation. I think maybe in, in Kent particularly and more widely, we, we haven't had this kind of uh, situation before where there's a, uh, an independent group pulling the levers in the form of uh, Nigel Farage, who's, mm. who's a very astute operator, whatever whatever you think about it. Yeah. Talk about Labour, what sort of challenges do you envisage them facing in the future? You're sitting with 400 MPs, um, you've only got 120 jobs or whatever it is um, to, to, to give out, so you're possibly going to have you know, the, the, the guts of 300 MPs on the back benches kicking their heels, um, some of them very, very ambitious people, and maybe some of them weren't expecting to get picked mm. so what sort of problems do you think that might, um, might throw well I mean the classic ambitious MPs it's the tale as old as time of MPs basically getting annoyed when they don't get promoted when they feel that obviously they're the best person for the job and nobody else comes close and all the rest of it I think also what will be quite a significant problem for Starmer in particular is he has no excuse now he has all these MPs he's got this massive majority if in five years time he says well we couldn't really get what everything we wanted done because oh, that's not going to wash with the public I don't think he's got this massive majority now the problem is delivering with it and getting things done and making making people feel that the country's moving in the right direction. When people make a protest vote like this, they 
they they do it because they're trying to register a protest, and they certainly have done that in no short order with the last sort of twenty four hours. But what, the, the the problem that may arise for for Keir Starmer and, and the Labour Party generally is is that people are impatient for that change. He's talked about change. How can he deliver it? How how do you stop the small boats? How do you stop prison overcrowding? How do you fix the NHS? How, there's so many things that need to be done. I mean, we all work in local government or covering the local government, and local government's in a mess. How do you, how does he fix that? There are so many things that he needs to address. Yeah. Yes, yes, there are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think Ellie Reeves, the deputy national campaign coordinator, was in Medway earlier this week, and she referenced a, a policy which had been sort of floated previously, but hadn't yet been confirmed, which is uh, sort of multi-year financial settlements for local government. And I think we're going to see a lot of that sort of thing. Not massive, groundbreaking, you know, really innovative ideas, but sort of small scale, life improvement sort of changes that I think they're hoping will incrementally, you know, if you increase improve everything by 1%, then eventually everything increases by a significant amount. I think that's what they might be looking more towards. Mm. Whether that will be enough is another question. I mean, how many parliaments do you need to sort the NHS out? I mean, it's it's it's, it's, never, it's, it's infinite. So, let's talk very briefly about turnout. It wasn't the weather. It was a nice day on on, uh, on Thursday. Whoa, what, Dan, you've always got something to say about turnout. What do you think the uh, the drivers were behind that? Well, I mean, so it's important to turn out. The BBC reckon national turnout was about sixty percent, and in some seats in in Kent, like Sittingbourne and Sheppey, it was as low as fifty one percent, which is like dismal by pretty much any standard in an advanced Western mm. democracy with with universal suffrage. Twenty nineteen general election, the total national turnout was sixty seven percent, so it's quite a significant decrease. And I think part of it is what. I, th- I think anyone could have told you a long time ago is that people aren't enthusiastic in their support for any political party. People don't trust politicians. People don't trust political parties. I think it shows even further, you know, Labour have won by virtue of not being the Conservative Party. That doesn't necessarily mean they will or won't deliver on what they've promised. But some, it, it, yeah, some would argue it means they've got, a, yeah, they've got a strong majority but quite a weak mandate. And exactly, that's, that's it makes yeah. them quite brittle, even yeah, though even though yeah. they have a huge parliamentary majority. So that that is another problem he's got to face, isn't it? There's, there's a lot of diversity here, actually, in Sitting on the It makes it, I think, a really, as a constituency, many of the key opportunities, as well as challenges that the country faces, are encapsulated here. And it is somewhere where we as Labour Party and what we put forward as our programme for government actually can really bear fruit um, and really, and really boost, boost the local area and, and hopefully improve the quality of people's lives here. I mean, number one, um, I've talked about this a lot, but it matters to me. I mean, the uh, number of GPs we have here is incredibly low. And that's not just because of all the challenges that the NHS is facing nationally. It's also because there are some local structural reasons why actually it's been hard for GPs to set practices up here uh, and really meet the uh, challenges and needs of local people. So I want to work closely, uh, obviously, with general practitioners and doctors and the NHS and the council and and really see if we can crack that one over the next, over the next little while. That's like priority. Um, but beyond that, there's the whole program of renewal that we've been talking about the Labour Party all the way through this campaign. And um, I don't think it's any secret that the country's had uh, a rough few years. Um, and honestly, look, and needs a new politics. Uh, so one of the things I want to bring to this is actually a degree of, I mean, hopefully just professionalism and assurance, but also connections to everyone here on the ground. So, so for me, being an, being an MP is, it's not just, it's not, it's not about, it's not just about Westminster as we know. It's actually about really, uh, being fully feet on the ground here and being able to under, work to understand all of the, as I say, the challenges and opportunities here, which is my job of the next few months, and then make sure that our plans to renew Britain are really bring benefits here on the ground, for people to call the shepherd. Dan, you, you just mentioned uh, sitting born in Sheppey. That was the um, the Gordon Henderson seat, which um, has changed hands. What was the situation there? That was a low turnout, wasn't it? It was quite a low turnout. It was f- f- you know, just under fifty two percent, which is pretty dire. Um, but pr- previously, in the twenty nineteen election, Gordon Henderson had a majority of more than twenty thousand. It was huge. But this time round, the, the Labour Party won it by you know, not much more than three hundred votes, with the Conservatives in second and um, and the Reform and Reform UK very close behind the Conservatives. Only only about. A thousand votes behind them. If reform didn't exist and didn't stand in that seat, the 
Conservatives would have stormed it easily, um, but because of that, it became a you know quite a close three horse race um, with with Reform UK taking up an awful lot of presumably former Tory voters, and that's a pretty good example of the the general function of reform across the whole election. It's as a as a massive impediment to the Tory vote. Just uh, bringing in editor Matt Ramson to talk about the company wide effort to bring the results to you overnight. Um, what happened then? Hi, Simon. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, incredible effort right across uh, the company. Um, Overnight, we've had 50 journalists at 18 counts right across Kent bringing live um, results, reaction, analysis, um, special guests. We've been live on um, KMTV. Kent Online's been running throughout the night with various stories telling people what's happening. Uh, KMFM started early this morning telling people what's been happening as they wake up. And here we are in the podcast now talking about it as well. Uh, The final piece of the uh, jigsaw will be next week with our papers when uh, we'll bring readers absolute uh, in-depth coverage of, of what happened. I think there's a lot of journalists We'll want to have a, a nice light on in a darkened room over the weekend. It's been it's been a long night, hasn't it? I think we've yeah. all been up for the best part of thirty hours now. Yeah. So uh, the, hopefully the end is nigh for us. About a week ago, we um, stood in the studio and, and uh, talked about our predictions. Um, I can't remember what, I, what my prediction was, but uh, yours, Paul, was I believe nine conservatives and then a split with the other nine one of which would be a Liberal Democrat. Um, so you're going to claim, obviously, that that was the, the closest. I am indeed going to claim that is the, the, the closest yeah. of all our projections. And uh, I feel the prize money should be coming my way. So, yeah. Yeah. OK. And Robert Boddy? I think I said nine Conservatives, seven Labour and two Lib Dems. And I think there should be recounts. <laughs> Check the results, because I think I'm still right. OK. And what about you, Dan? Um, as I remember, I said basically whatever electoral calculus said. I was always firm in my opinion. Tunbridge Wells would go Liberal Democrat, so I'll claim that. But I, re- I said it was, I think I was saying fourteen Labour, one Liberal Democrat, and three to Conservatives. So the Conservatives, I guess, did twice as good as I expected them to. So um, mm. I'll, I'll give them that. But yes, I'm ha- happy to admit I was wrong. Yeah, I, I think the electoral calculus actually f- finished up saying that there would be four Conservatives left over, mm. one Liberal Democrat, and the rest would be Labour. So. Everybody, I think the, t- the polls generally were actually sort of not too far away from from the mark, really. I mean, they're really these pastors and their ever shifting models. We were all close at one point, so it's fine. Yeah, and uh, just for the record, uh, the uh, Conservatives won six, the Liberal Democrats won one, and the the Labour Party took eleven seats in the general election. <laughs> Okay, folks, that's your lot for this special edition podcast. Thanks to Rob, Dan, Paul and Matt. We're all heading off for a well-earned kip. You can keep abreast of the latest election news on Kent Online. And see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Kent Politics Podcast. Don't forget to check out stories throughout the week on the politics page of Kent Online. And you can watch the Kent Politics Show with Rob Bailey on KMTV every Friday at 5pm or on demand at kmtv.co.uk. This has been an I Am Listening original podcast. For more information, head over to our website, im-listening.co.uk. 